Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast. Building and implementing an FR slash AR program for the Arc Flash Hazard. Sponsored by Bulwark. This is Alan Ferguson, Associate Editor at Safety and Health Magazine, filling in for Kevin Drewley. I will moderate today's session, and thank you all for joining us. We'll start the presentation in a few minutes, but first I want to go over some preliminary items. First of all, today's slides are not available for download, but Bulwark is offering a white paper on today's topic. You can find it on the Resources widget at the bottom of your screen. The views of today's speaker and organizations are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or magazine endorses those items. At the end of today's webcast, we will conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, simply type it in the text box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen and click the button for Submit Question. Feel free to ask your question any time during the presentation. You don't have to wait for the question and answer session to begin. Now, we'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but because of the large number of participants today, we might not get to every question. Any unanswered questions will be forwarded to today's speaker. For basic troubleshooting information, click the Help button located on your screen. At the end of the webcast, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey. I'll let you more, know more about that after the presentation. This webcast is archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Our speaker today is Derek Sang. Technical Training Manager at Bulwark and a subject matter expert in the flame-resistant clothing industry. Derek has de developed more than 40 hours of training curriculum covering all aspects of FR clothing and has conducted more than 250 seminars on the hazards of arc flash and flash fire. Derek, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction, Alan, and uh, good morning and or good afternoon to everyone who is attending today. I just want to say thank you for taking uh, your time to learn a little bit more about uh, flame-resistant and arc-rated clothing, specifically for the arc flash hazard. So uh, let's get started. So just to really just let's introduce and kind of take a quick look at uh, what and, and why we're having uh, our conversation today and, and really what uh, we're looking to protect against. I'm going to uh, just take a second here. For some reason, my, my screen is all pixelated. So just bear with me here a second and let's see if I can try and refresh this and get us uh, back to where I can see my slides. Okay, slowly coming back. There we are. I now have and are able to see them. So I apologize for that, but uh, proceeding here. So why do we need flame-resistant clothing in general? Obviously, all the injury that, that ultimately leads to uh, fatality is caused by clothing catching fire and continuing burn. Flame resistant clothing by definition, all it does is put itself out. It self extinguishes. That fact alone is going to mitigate the event, minimize injury, and ultimately take something that could potentially be fatal and make it survivable. So what is flame resistant clothing? Again, they're just fabrics that, regardless of the technology, are designed to put themselves out. These are horrific events. If in an arc flash, the temperatures can reach tens of thousands of degrees in, in literally a blink of an eye. When you superheat air that 
dramatically that quickly. You get a whole bunch of other stuff happening that's not good. You get concussive force, 2,200 square foot pounds. You get acoustic energy, 165 decibels. You get blinding white light. So you can't see, you can't hear, and if you're unfortunate enough to be wearing clothing that doesn't have flame resistant properties, you're now on fire. And the arc flash is over. That, that circuit breaker, that fuse, that, that limiter of energy has shut off to the equipment, and in six cycles, ten cycles, the arc is done. Clothing ignition is now extending the event far beyond it ever should have went on, and that's where all your injury comes from. So these fabrics today are either natural or synthetic and mostly are going to be a combination of above. Uh, make their design to eliminate, excuse me, mit mitigate, not eliminate uh, burn injury. And obviously survival is correlates to how much of you is injured. So anything that we can do to minimize that is going to be uh, beneficial. We have to constantly remind folks that we live in a secondary protective clothing environment. And when we're training folks, we are constantly reminding them that this is secondary protective clothing. So if you have secondary, you have primary. So what's the difference? The easiest analogy that I can make is think of firefighters. You have a burning building, you have a big red truck, flashing red lights, siren, firefighters roll up. They've probably already donned the upper and lower half of their bunker gear. They've got their specialized hard hat, specialized boots, gloves, and most importantly for what they're about to do, their respirator. And then they walk into a burning building. How are they able to do that? Well, for a couple of reasons. One, they're firefighters. That's what they're trained to do. And secondly, their PPE is designed for long-term thermal exposure and for what its intended purpose is. Now, when they get back on the truck after putting that fire out and they roll back to the station house, do they need to be wearing all that PPE? No, they don't. It's task-based. They are knowingly donning that personal protective equipment for that task at hand. They are knowingly going into a thermal event. In our world, it's secondary because why? These thermal events are accidental. We don't know when they're going to happen. If we did know when they were going to happen, we just wouldn't be there. So when we have an accidental arc flash event and we happen to be there, our PPE has to be on. So we have to be wearing it from the start of the shift to the end of the shift, regardless. So that's the primary difference that we have to coach people up on is that their PPE is secondary protective apparel and it needs to be worn all the time. We also have to encourage people to understand what their FR clothing is not. They are not invincible. They are not impervious to injury. They are not going to be able to don a, a seven ounce FR work shirt and a 12 ounce FR denim and go into burning buildings and start saving babies. That's not what it's designed for. It is designed as the last line of defense when everything else fails. We always want to look at the hierarchy uh, of controls. We want to eliminate or replace that arc flash uh, hazard potential. We want to engineer that arc flash energy down. And if we put people into energized electrical equipment, we want to have administrative procedures, policies, et cetera, electrical safe work practices that we follow to make sure that we are minimizing the potential for someone being hurt. That all being said, if there is an arc flash, all those steps have failed. You can't eliminate or replace it any longer. Engineering's not going to affect it, and your admins and policies are definitely not going to prevent injury. What is left to prevent injury is your PPE. 
and you have to have it on in order for it to work. Think about it this way. Uh, one of the leading industries right now in engineering that, that's forefront that we all get to see is think of the auto industry. Think of automobiles in the last five years. Think about the commercials that you're inundated with on, on a regular basis. For example, here you've, this is an old commercial, but you see this little smart car uh, holding up this giant SUV. How's it able to do that? Engineering. It has a titanium frame that's designed to protect those occupants. Uh, also, believe it or not, that tiny little smart car has eight airbags inside it. Again, all engineering designed to protect the occupants. Uh, cars today have side view mirrors that will notify you if there's something in your blind spot. Some of them even have technology and engineering to where it will not resist you trying to change lanes if there's something in your blind spot. That's all engineering. You look at uh, some of these cars today have uh, sensors are raised to where they will stop if you do not react fast enough. Some of these sensor arrays allow you to parallel park. No longer do you need to spend hours trying to parallel park. You just simply hit the button and the car parks for you because of the engineering. That all being said, why do we rely on 70-year-old technology? Why is the number one law across the land click it or ticket? Why is it that engaging your safety belt is mandatory, especially if you're driving a company vehicle? You would think that it would be obsolete by now, but it's not. And why isn't it? It's a proven, life-saving piece of equipment. Regardless of how bad it is on the inside of the vehicle, it's better than 250 feet down that asphalt. Ask any highway patrol officer the survivability of ejection accidents. It's virtually nil. So the same mindset when it comes to our clothing as PPE, it's our last line of defense. It's our safety belt. When all that engineering around us has failed and we are in that arc flash, the clothing on our back is extremely important. Just lastly, uh, before we dive into kind of the meat of what we were talking about today. I used to have, and you can easily access these too, if you go to the Google box that's on uh, your computer you're listening today and you put in keywords like arc flash, electrical burns, electrical accidents, uh, you put in these keywords and, and you'll probably populate your inbox three to four times a month uh, half of those will be arc flash incidents, the other half will be uh, shock incidents, but you can easily over the course of a short period of time have a catalog of relevant articles talking to the hazard as it is today. That being said, I used to share tons of articles, I don't anymore, but I still share this one article, and here's why. This is 2004. If anybody can go back to 2000, what happened in 2000? NFPA 70E came out and said you have to have, at that time, that the terminology was flame-resistant clothing, outermost layer to protect equal to or greater than the incident energy uh, of, of the equipment for the first time. So that's in 2000. So here we are in 2004, four years later. We have an electrician working on HVAC equipment in a school in a suburb of Chicago. That's not the important piece. The next paragraph is the important piece. The Cook County Medical Examiner. Ladies and gentlemen, you never want the medical examiner talking about you. That's the coroner. In order to gain entry into his office, you are a fatality. The coroner said there was a spark coroner speak for arc flash that ignited this electrician's clothing and he succumbed to those injuries uh, in, the, in the hospital. So he succumbed to those burn injuries that were induced by his clothing catching fire. Notice it wasn't the arc flash. The arc flash was just the ignition point for the fuel to catch fire. 
for lack of a $60 shirt and an $80 pair of pants, you have an electrical worker who has become a statistic. And the sad thing is, is it never needed to happen. If he was wearing arc-rated clothing, clothing with flame-resistant properties, clothing that put themselves out, he would not be a fatality. Would he have been hurt? Possibly. We don't know to what extent. But he definitely would not have been a fatality. So where are the regulations and the standards today? Well, from the utility side, we have seen the regulations finally catching up to where we knew the standards knew we needed to be years earlier. So in 2014, everybody was made aware, 1910-269 came out in the final ruling, in the regulation, now it's law, you have to have ARC-rated clothing equal to a reasonable estimate of the incident energy that your employees can be up against. So that was a big uh, motivator there. It was long overdue. Uh, obviously, for years we knew that uh, clothing could ignite in arc flashes. We knew there was a solution in flame-resistant arc-rated clothing. And finally, we have the law catching up. And in fact, when this was put into OMB, the Office of Management Budget, the financial part of it is and the people part of it is is the determination was 20 lives a year would be saved by this uh, law and up to 118 serious injuries and all the dollars and cents in and around that, it was tens and tens of millions of dollars would be saved by uh, implementing this into our uh, electric utilities. So what changed? Well. A couple of things. Uh, if you had estimated your incident energies and you had determined that the large majority of your equipment was under eight calories and you were already in an arc rated uh, clothing program, more than likely you had defaulted to the 70E terminology, which was CAT2, which was eight calories or better of uh, protection. So you're probably wearing eight calories or more already and you wouldn't have to change a whole lot. If you were, for example, uh, in a utility that had only uh, flame-resistant shirts and they were allowed to wear uh, non-FR heavyweight denim jeans, you would probably have to change that lower half. The other scenario is, is you do your, uh, uh, your estimate of your electrical equipment and you find out you've got some equipment that is greater than what your current clothing specification is. Uh, if you're at 8 calories, you might find that you have some equipment that's at 10, 15, 20. So what do you do in those cases? Well, you really have a couple of options. Uh, one, get further away. Uh, if you don't use hot sticks, implement a hot stick train. Become a hot stick. Uh, get the end of the hot stick. If you have to be hands-on, then you have to have more uh, arc-rated value or a greater ATPV, arc thermal performance value, in your clothing. How do you do that? That's where layering can come in and provide some additional advantages. So when arc flashes happen, this just happens to be a, a picture of an arc flash incident that took back uh, place back in, in early 2000s. We had a meter arc here. Uh, we had the PPE from the electrical worker. You'll notice the little charcoal briquette on the right. That's his leather protector for his rubber gloves that were there for shock protection. Uh, you see his safety glasses, and you'll also notice the charring on his uh, arc-rated flame-resistant uh, shirt here. This is also what he was wearing underneath. Now, We'll touch on this and then we'll kind of come back to it in a different way. This is a 100% cotton t-shirt, which by all the standards, whether it's uh, ASTM 1506, whether, it, whether it's NFPA, et cetera, you're allowed to wear 100% natural fibers underneath your uh, arc-rated flame-resistant garments. So this is perfectly acceptable. What the concern is, though, is what you see here is charring. Charring is a 
precessor to what? Ignition. So if there was a little bit more energy in that arc flash that electrical worker was in front of, a little bit more break open of his outermost layer, what could potentially be the hazard? Well, obviously the hazard is having a cotton clothing fire underneath an arc rated flame resistant shirt. It's what we call the chimney effect. And we don't want that to ever happen. So when we look at layering to meet the hazard, we're looking at trying to one, increase how much protection we have, but also take anything that could potentially ignite and hurt us out of the equation. So what are layering basics? Well, any garment worn as an outer layer, including rain mare, must have uh, and must be arc rated. A lot of folks are, well, Derek, what's the difference between arc rating and flame resistant? Well, in order to be arc rated, you already by default have to be flame resistant because you're flame resistant first, you go through additional testing to have an arc rating. So by default, all arc rated garments are flame resistant, but not all flame resistant garments are arc rated. So make sure that our outermost layer is arc rated. Then any garment that is underneath that must be of a natural fiber. It can't melt, drip, or add to the injury. What are natural fibers? The most common everybody thinks of, obviously, is cotton. If it's the cold time of year right now and we're in Minnesota, North Dakota, or any of our other cold states, wool is underneath there, and that's a natural fiber. And then, obviously, uh, silk is another uh, natural fiber that is permissible. All of those that I just mentioned, though, won't melt, drip, and necessarily add to the ignition up until uh, excuse me, won't melt, drip, or add to the injury up until we have ignition. So they are allowed, but not necessarily maybe maximizing protection. So what do arc-rated FR base layers eliminate, and what do they help with? Uh, first, you can get more protective in two lighter weight layers than you necessarily can in a, in a heavier layer. For example, if you're currently wearing uh, eight plus calories of protection in a Cat 2 garment, you're probably sitting anywhere between six and a half and eight ounces of material in that shirt. If you have a 10 calorie hazard or a 12 calorie hazard, do you want to build a outer layer that meets that? Well, guess what? More than likely, in order to get to 12 calories, you're going to be 8 to 9 ounces of fabric in that single outer layer. You can easily get to that 10 or 12 calories of protection in a 4.5 ounce base layer and a 5.5 ounce outer layer, so two lighter weight layers, and you're going to exceed that 10 or 12 calories in the large majority of cases. So that's one advantage. The other big advantage is when we have failure of that outer layer. When will that outer layer fail? You don't really know. Uh, if you have an ATPV in your garment, if your garment says 8.6 ATPV, that means in testing that outer layer hasn't broken open. It's registered a second degree burn, but you still have a outer layer there, the sensor is reading 1.2 calories of energy is now coming through, that's the onset of a second degree burn, and they stop the testing. Well, when will that outer layer break open? You don't really know as a wear, but they do fail. They're not, if it's rated for eight and I put it in a 15, more than likely it's going to fail. So that Gorman is going to look like the picture we have on the lower right. You're going to have areas in which the fabric is going away. It's starting to break open. And what you have underneath now comes directly into play. Unfortunately, on the top picture, we had a young electrical worker who was wearing the wrong undergarment. Now, remember back to when I said natural fibers, that was your cotton, your wools, and your silks? Guess what those injuries came from? 
That was a young electrical worker who was working in a hot environment who thought that his high-performance, fully synthetic garment that he wears at the gym would be a good choice underneath so that he could wick the moisture, stay cool on those hot summer days. Well, guess what happened in that arc flash? His arc-rated shirt did its job. It self-extinguished, did not ignite. It would have protected him. Unfortunately, all that radiant heat, all that other thermal energy is passing through that outer layer. It hits that fully synthetic uh, undergarment, and it melted. Now, it melted instantaneously. And remember, one of the other things that we have in an arc flash is concussive force. 2,200 square foot-pounds of concussive force took that molten synthetic material and drove it into his skin. Those scars there that you see was post-hospital burn unit stay after being deburred of that plastic for 15 days. And those scars he will carry as a constant reminder of what not to wear underneath his arc-rated clothing. The other things uh, FR arc-rated base layers allow you to do is it eliminates the underwear police. I know you're chuckling, but bear with me here a second. If you're a safety director and you're passing your crew and you see those white triangles underneath their button-down arc-rated shirt and you're looking at all those white triangles and you're going, my guys are all wearing 100% cotton, we're good. Is it 100% cotton? Can you get white T-shirts undergarments that are 50-50, 80-20, 65-35? Sure you can. So can you guarantee that no matter how much training you've given your guys that they all have 100% cotton base layers? You can't. And it's really, really difficult uh, to police. So layering with uh, arc-rated garments sure helps there. So Do's and don'ts. Regardless of the hazard, arc flasher and flash fire, when discussing undergarments, only natural fibers. That's kind of phase one. That's like a good, better, best uh, mentality. If you're layering non-melting flammable garments, it's permitted to be worn under your arc-rated garment for added protection. However, if it's non-FR, you don't get any benefit as far as increasing the arc rating. The only way to determine what your increased arc rating is, is two things. One, you have to have an arc rated FR base layer underneath an arc rated FR shirt. And then you have to test that system as worn. So you have to take it to an independent third party and have them test your configuration so that you know what that system is. Our standards, in fact, ASTM 1506, which is kind of the overarching standard for, for arc flash, recognizes that in many cases additional layers are going to be optimal. If you are doing and working with high currents, if you're close to uh, the energized equipment, uh, then potential calculations, you are going to want to have additional layers of protection. And obviously, Every time that happens, we don't want to be jumping into flash suits in order to get that additional protection. So layering up with lightweight uh, garments for arc-rated protection can be advantageous. NFPA 70E has dedicated a whole annex in the back of the book as far as giving guidelines to layering up to meet the hazard. So even in general industry, they recognize that you can get additional protection by layering up. And they also talk to, it's important to understand what the total system calculation is. The only way to do that is to test the system. You can't add the ATPVs together. And here's what I mean. You have an outer layer that says it's eight calories of protection. You have a base layer that says it's five calories of protection. By default, you're not 13. And the only way to know is to have those been tested either A, 
by the manufacturer, assuming that they're like they're like uh, manufactured garments, meaning that it's bulwark over bulwark, Carhartt over Carhartt, dry fire over dry fire, uh, whatever the case may be, that the manufacturer has done the testing, or an independent third party, if you're using bulwark over Carhartt or Carhartt over bulwark or NSA over whatever, et cetera, et cetera, an independent third party has to do that testing so that you know what it is. It's not as simple as adding them together, and in fact, it's not allowed to add them together to even have a baseline. Dr. Thomas Neal, in the final ruling, talks directly to that. The only sure way to obtain a rating for layered clothing system is to measure the ARC rating for the system. You have to test it as it is to be worn in order to know. So what arc rated base layers is correct for you? They make them in short sleeve, they make them in long sleeve. What are we looking at? Well, obviously, if we're looking at gaining the benefit of a arc rated system, can we have a short sleeve? The answer is generally no because it's no longer a system. If you had a eight calorie long sleeve button down shirt over top of this short sleeve, is that a system? It's not a system unless it's long sleeve because from the bicep down to the wrist, you are only single layer. So you have to then assume whatever that ATPV is, that's your system for that upper half. So if you're wearing an eight calorie shirt, guess what? You can only do less than eight calorie work because that is the lowest ATPV that you have in the system. Now, if you have the same eight calorie shirt over this long sleeve base layer and you test it, and that testing tells you you're 24 calories of protection in that combination, which is not uncommon. It's not uncommon to see an eight calorie shirt and a six calorie base layer test that high. So what work can you do there? Can you do 24 calorie work? Can you do 23 calorie work? You then have to look at the lower half. If that lower half denim is 18 calories of protection and you have a 24 calorie upper half, guess what? You have to do 18 cal or less work because the lowest ATPV in that system is now from the waist down. And obviously we're assuming that we have the appropriate uh, headgear, head protection, eye protection, and everything that way also. Uh, bulwark, and again, not to be commercial, but just to give you an idea, and other top manufacturers have very, very similar information. Uh, on our website, we actually have a calculator. If you know what your bulwark outer layer is and you know what your bulwark base layer is, you can plug it into the calculator and it will spit out what the combined ATPV is. For example, this shirt, this base layer has a combined ATPV of 24. And guess what? We had a 6.3 outer layer, a 6.4 base layer, and now we have a 24 calorie uh, from the waist up. Remember, we have to protect the Obviously, what the lower half is, we need to know what that number is. And then, obviously, if we're in front of incident energies, uh, we may have to have the appropriate headgear on. But over 150 combinations uh, we have on our website. And like I said, the other top manufacturers uh, primarily have uh, their combinations also. So how do we have to train our people on this stuff? When we select the proper arc-rated FR garment, that's just the first step. Training is required on all PPE, and in fact, 1910-132 speaks specifically to uh, PPE, and guess what? Shirts, pants, coveralls, uh, your arc flash suits, your hard hats, your face shields, your balaclavas, all that falls into 1910-132. We have to train you on how to properly don and doff. That's our fancy way of putting it on, taking it off. Adjust it properly. Make sure that it's not too loose. Make sure it's not too tight. Uh, all those things are part of it. We have to talk to what the limitations of our PPE are. Remember, it's not so much what you can do. The biggest caveat is just because you're wearing this stuff, what you can't do. And then 
all your employees have to demonstrate that they understand. We have to document it, record it, and do all those things. So just real quickly, as we're getting into this, some, uh, some do's and don'ts. Uh, believe it or not, whether we're electric utilities, whether we're general industry 7E, this is how you all are supposed to look. Sleeves rolled down, shirt buttoned up, and yes, your shirt tucked in. And yes, all the regulations and standards talk to, that is how to properly interface with your PPE. 1506 uses the term interface. 70E actually walks you through and tells you to tuck your shirt in in order to properly have the system implemented. When I walk around and I do my site visits, unfortunately, I see a lot of these. This is how uh, PPE is used in the field. Now, I'll hear the comment. Derek, I'm working de-energized. Derek, I'm on my break. Derek, we're sitting at the truck. No one's even working. We're doing our uh, tailgate, and we're figuring out. What's the concern? The concern is, is you get distracted and you forget, and you go into energized equipment unbuttoned, untucked, or sleeves rolled up, or any combination thereof with and that can be unfortunate if there happens to be an arc flash at that particular time deploy your PPE correctly other things to think about uh, that we make this huge investment in arc rated flame resistant clothing and there's little nuances that can cost us dearly and in many cases may nullify all the investment that you've made. Things to be aware of. What we put on our head is important. Make sure that if you're wearing beanies, make sure if you're wearing skull caps, make sure if you're wearing bandanas, that those things all have flame resistant properties. They're at least made of similar fabrics that will self extinguish will not melt, drip, and add to the injury. So be very, very cautious of what goes on our head. The other thing is, is when we invest in this uh, brown duck jacket, which if you are familiar with purchasing arc-rated flame-resistant garments, that's not an inexpensive coat by any means. But that hoodie, is that hoodie arc-rated and flame-resistant? Does that hoodie have flame-resistant properties? Why are we concerned? Well, if it's worn in this configuration, you should be confer concerned in a couple reasons. Primarily, that's a hang-up hazard if you're in and up and around uh, equipment. Secondly, guess what? It's now the outermost layer. What, is the, what do the standards and regulations say about the outermost layer? It needs to be arc rated equal to or greater than a reasonable estimate of, of the hazard. Or in 70E, it needs to be greater than the projected incident energy. Is it? So make sure that uh, we're not doing things like that that could jeopardize the investment we're making in our program. So are we wearing the, so when we get into training, wear the correct base layers under your flame resistant arc rated garments. It's important. Uh, and by base layers, I'm being general here. I'm not just saying it has to be arc rated and flame resistant. If you're gonna wear cotton or other natural fibers, make sure they're as close to 100% of that as possible. Make sure it's not an 80-20, a 60-40. Uh, definitely make sure it's not your uh, athletic performance gym gear that uh, is going to keep you cool and wick moisture during the hot months. Wear them correctly. That's as equal important as anything. Deploy your PPE properly. Things to think about. Two lightweight layers can be, and in many cases are, more protective than a single heavy outer layer. What does that do? One makes people more uh, comfortable. You get more compliance long term. Uh, FR base layers take away the potential for ignition of that underneath layer that's a natural fiber if there's uh, excess energy. And they can also be far greater to monitor than uh, you're just 100% cotton t shirt. Uh, all top manufacturers making FR AR base layers have. Uh, put their logo right there at the neckline, that's an identifier. That's something where you can scan down the line, take a quick look, and you can see that your people uh, are wearing uh, their proper PPE. 
Care and maintenance is essential to your PPE's performance. So once you've selected it, uh, once you have trained people on how to properly uh, use it in the field, now you need to uh, train them up on how to properly care and maintain it. Uh, the good thing is, is all the manufacturers, all the, the compliant manufacturers are providing all that information on the tags. Yes, you see a lot of tags on your uh, flame-resistant arc-rated clothing. Why? The standards require that when we manufacture these, we communicate a ton of information to you, and some of that, part of that information is how to care and maintain it. Uh, the other way to go is you can download PDFs from, uh, from websites relatively easily. Other folks have gone to make simple things like uh, laundry magnets that you can put right there on your washer and dryer to remind you, uh, but it's pretty common sense stuff. The great thing about the quality in today's uh, FR clothing market is it's really, really hard to mess this stuff up. A couple things you've got to remember, and I'm sure if you're wearing this stuff you've heard, no chlorine bleach. That makes a lot of sense. Obviously, we don't want to add uh, something that's going to weaken the fibers uh, over time into the process. The sneaky one nowadays is avoid peroxides. Where do I find peroxide? Anything that says OxyClean on it. Stay away from those. Good, just regular straight liquid detergent is going to help you out. Uh, fabric softeners, again, we're talking about over time, accumulation. Uh, many fabric softeners, both in the dryer sheets and the liquid format, are petroleum-based. That accumulation could, over time, hinder the performance of your FR when you need it. Uh, so if you happen to wash it in, F in fabric softener, uh, dry it in fabric softener, just take it out and rewash it. You haven't deterred the FR performance forever, uh, so just rewash it. Other simple things to do is like turn your garments inside out for color retention. That's helpful there. Don't wash them on the hottest temperatures. Don't dry them on the hottest temperatures. Again, just good, simple uh, care and maintenance stuff there. Uh, it's not super complicated. The one question we do get, though, that a lot of people uh, want to know, obviously, is if a garment is stained, are the FR properties compromised? Here's the answer. If it's stained and you launder it, and it does not smell of accelerant, meaning that staining was caused by oils, greases, other petrochemical agents, and you launder it, and you give it a quick sniff test, and that sniff test says, hey, no fuel present, the staining, your FR properties are fine. You just have a stained garment. So both these pictures, if they are going back into the field after being laundered, and there is no fuel odor, the FR properties are fine. Now, if you take a look at the garment on the top, and that's during the work day, and that's secondary accelerant, I probably want to do two things. Get him out of harm's way. And secondly, if possible, change out of that shirt. That is a lot of fuel on that shirt. And those FR properties that don't have fuel on them will work. The ones that have fuel on them, you are going to, that fuel is going to ignite and burn until the fuel is gone. And it, your FR properties will not come into play in those areas. That's what we call, well, in that case, it would be a hot spot. That would be an extremely large hot spot. More than likely during the workday, you're going to look something like this. Those are oils, greases, secondary accelerants. Uh, that will create a hot spot. Typically, if you had an arc flash incident, you would, could potentially see those ignite, and then you've got the padding thing that typically you see people do as that fuel is used up. Fuel will always be used up if it's ignited. Now, it may or may not ignite because there may not be enough fuel there, but during the workday, the lower one, you're probably going to continue to work on and do what you need to do. Uh, again, if you launder those, and they smell like fuel, they are fuel, continue laundering until the fuel odor is gone. If you cannot get rid of the fuel odor, you need to retire that garment. If it smells like fuel, it is fuel. Repairing and replacing. 
Rule of thumb, a nickel and three inches. Uh, if the hole is a nickel or smaller, you can sew it up. If the rip is three inches or less, you can probably sew it up. Uh, the caveat is you have to have Aramid or Nomex thread in order to do that sewing. If you're going to patch, you have to patch with like materials. That means you have to use an old garment as your source for like materials. You cut a piece out, you sew it up with your Aramid thread, and you go back into the field. I have a couple of thoughts on that, but let's get through this, this one here. Uh, those elbows, that's unrepairable. That's retire that garment, get a new one. The one in the middle where you see the rip on the thigh there, that's greater than three inches. It's not going to be easily repaired. Again, retire that garment. Lower left on that pant leg, that is far greater than uh, three inches, but it's on a seam. Can you make the decision to possibly sew that up with Aramid thread and be okay with that? Mm, I guess you could. Wouldn't recommend it. Now, on the shoulder here, again, we're on the seam. Is that three inches or less? You can probably make that repair. Here's what I want you to start thinking about, though. Start thinking about your PPE like you think about other PPE. If you have a small crack in your hard hat, are you going to replace it? Yes, you are. If you have a small crack in your safety glasses, are you going to repair them? Yes, you are. Even bigger picture, if you climb, if you go to height and you have a fall harness, would you repair your phrase? If you had a cut, as long as that cut's less than an inch, I'm only 180 pounds, it's rated to 300 pounds, I'll be okay. No, you wouldn't climb and rely on your last line of defense if you fall on a fall harness that's either frayed or has tears in it or is ripped or worst case scenario yet, you repaired. You don't do that. Start thinking about your, your clothing, uh, especially when it comes to arc flash protection and flash fire protection the same way. Inspect it daily. Check for holes, rips, tears, etc. Lay them on the bed. Go through uh, your rip tear inspection, just like you do on your gloves every day. You check your rubber gloves for the integrity. You check your, your rubber gloves uh, for, for ozone damage. Do the same thing. Just go through that uh, quick check. Just real quick here, uh, ARFR should be appropriate to the hazard, always the outermost layer, all natural, non-melting undergarments. Make sure you, they're clean, no flammable contaminants, especially when you start the day, and then repair correctly and retire from service when needed. Always, always button them up, tuck them in, and roll them. Unfortunately, this is a picture here of a, an electrical worker who had perfectly good arc rated shirt. You can see from where he rolled it up uh, to his shoulder there, there's no damage. He took off his rubbers and leathers. This was unfortunately a failure to verify that he had de-energized. He took off his rubbers and leathers. He rolled up his arc rated shirt and when he put the screwdriver into the energized equipment, it, it arced on him. Lastly, and I know we're getting tight on time and I do want to save some time for questions, uh, real quick here, check your uh, rain gear and your vests especially. These are huge uh, weak spots in many arc rated flame resistant clothing programs. The standard for uh, arc flash protection is 1891 for rain gear. For your vests, it's ASTM 1506 and it has an arc rating right in the label. If it doesn't have an ARC rating in that label, if it just says it's FR, wrong vest. If your rain gear says it's FR and it just quotes a 2302 standard, a 6413 standard, or worse yet, NFPA 701, it's the wrong rain gear. Real easy. If your rain gear costs 100 bucks, you got the wrong rain gear. If your rain gear is closer to $400, $500, you probably have the right rain gear. Uh, so check that for me real quick. In wrapping up, when you're looking at putting a program together, always get the manufacturer's guarantee in writing on letterhead and make sure it's signed uh, by that company. Why? That just gives you a good starting point that 
the guarantee is for the life of the Gorman and it's not tied to a standard. Remember, standards are bare minimum performance. The standard for arc flash is 25 laundrings. You do not want that guarantee to say meets ASTM 1506 standard. Because at 26 laundrings, your guarantee is gone. Ask for the test data for the hazard so that you're not getting flash fire test data for an arc flash hazard. Make sure any certifications that you get handed to you and then verify them. Don't take the manufacturer's certificate as uh, the absolute end all. Contact that uh, certification organization and get them to verify that the data is in, indeed accurate. And then specify only that certified compliant garments are on site. Work with proven supply chain partners. Remember, Everybody is good if there's no accident. Everybody's good if the garment hasn't been put in harm's way. Where the rubber meets the road and really what you're, you're purchasing is that insurance policy that that manufacturer can bring to bear tons of resources to help you uh, in worst case scenario. And then periodically police your program uh, for compliance. I apologize for rushing there near the end. Uh, that is my email if anybody wants to get a hold of me. We'll turn it over for Q&A. And as Alan said earlier, if we don't get to your question today, I get a copy of all the questions, and I am absolutely diligent about getting everybody uh, answers to the questions that are asked. So with that, I hand it back uh, to Alan and Isidore. Thank you. Great job as always, Derek. Uh, thank you once again for your excellent insights and expertise. Uh, before we start the q and I want to remind everyone of the evaluation survey we're asking you to complete. The survey should be appearing on your screen. Your input is important because it will help us improve future webcasts. If you do not see the evaluation survey on your screen, please turn off your pop-up blocker. You may also access the survey by clicking the survey button near the lower right part of your screen. With that, now let's get to some questions. Um, what kind of fastening devices should the garments have um, in terms of buttons, zippers, Velcro, et cetera? Uh, good question. Uh, as long as there are, uh, there is Velcro that is, uh, has flame-resistant properties. You don't want to have uh, Velcro that doesn't because you have a melt or drip issue on, on where that is. Uh, when you're having zippers or anything metal that is that, uh, my my layer that is it's not in a jacket uh, if it's in a coverall or if it's in a shirt and something that it'd be wearing and up to my skin make sure uh, and the manufacturing standards require that there's a layer of FR between me and anything metal so if there's a metal zipper there has to be a flap of FR so it can't just be bare metal against you even the posts on your jeans and your pants, et cetera, have to have FR uh, behind it because that metal is going to heat up, and we don't want that, uh, that energy transferring to me. So there, there has to be a barrier there. And then uh, the majority of all the quality manufacturers in the U.S. are using non-melting, uh, high-tenacity, uh, melanin buttons, et cetera. So they're, they're in no way adding to any of the potential injury from those fastener-type devices. Our next question, are, are there any high-visibility products with a FR and arc flash rating? Yes, there are. And in fact, uh, many, and again, uh, all the top manufacturers, uh, some that I've mentioned and, and maybe a few that I've missed, uh, high vis is, is very important right now, and in fact, many of the folks are building uh, single layer uh, high vis garments that are ANSI rated uh, to avoid having to put on additional layers like vests, etc. So you'll see a lot of those uh, uh, button down Henleys uh, that'll have uh, the segmented uh, reflective tapes with the uh, high vis backgrounds so they're ANSI compliant. You see a lot of hoodies and sweatshirts that are meeting those requirements, and a lot of folks are now building outerwear uh, to get to those high-vis standards. So if you hop on any of those websites uh, with those top folks, you should see 
a good offering of high-vis ANSI 107 compliant uh, garments being built today. Our next question, can leather belts be worn with FR clothing? Leather, uh, as long as it's uh, – leather is very, very resistant uh, to heat and, more importantly, very resistant to ignition. Uh, you'll see leather belts, they'll, they'll start to curl. You'll see, depending on proximity to the energy, you'll see obviously thermal damage, but you don't see ignition. Uh, so leather belts are fine. Even some of the uh, high-dense ballistic nylons hold up. You'll see a little bit of melting start, again, on pro proximity to the incident energy. Obviously, what we want to minimize on belts, and especially in an electrical environment, is how much metal is on that belt. Uh, we don't want to see those big, uh, you know, first place, you know, rodeo, cow wrestling uh, dinner plates on there. We want to keep that metal to a thing. So leather, high ballistic nylons, uh, they actually hold up with to ignition and those energies reasonably so they're not contributing to uh, any kind of burn injury so again if there's no burn injury being contributed we don't worry about them. Our next question are non-certified electrical or low voltage process control or maintenance employees uh, covered by the ARC flash standard and the FR slash AR clothing rules? Okay, uh, very complex question. Uh, there are specific guidelines, especially in 7E, when you're talking about what a qualified person is. And then obviously as the employer, you're the one who's qualifying them. So if you have qualified, you have unqualified. Uh, the toughest thing to train people on is the fact that they're unqualified. Now, can an unqualified person get into the arc flash boundary? If they are escorted by a qualified person, the answer is yes, because that qualified person may need that unqualified person to hold some tools, do some things for them to where they've given them clear instruction prior to entering there what their role is, but they are in the arc flash boundary. So yes, you would be then having to fulfill all the PPE requirements uh, that, that a qualified person uh, would have to fulfill. And that includes supervisory personnel also. Our next question, are there any new standards for boots? Uh, I'm not a boot guy. Uh, there are some, uh, when you get into uh, specific uh, electrical requirements as far as dielectric boots, uh, things like that, uh, primarily for, uh, you know, our utility applications and even in our 70E applications, the large majority of them are uh, leather boots, uh, non-conductive soles, uh, those kind of things. And there is direction in uh, our standards and to what those are. And then into some of the higher voltage uh, requirements, there, there's additional. Uh, unfortunately, that's kind of outside my personal, uh, my personal scope. Uh, during welding applications, is a um, FR slash AR clothing recommended? So welding is unique. Uh, there are, unfortunately, not a lot of guidance uh, in uh, either our regulatory side uh, or and into our standards. In fact, they use very, very similar stand, uh, language that 1910-269 uh, did years ago, uh, that whatever you wear can't melt, drip, or add to the injury. Unfortunately, people then think that cotton is a safety upgrade. People then think that wearing cotton in welding environments is okay because it doesn't explicitly say you can't. Uh, cotton is fine because it will not melt drip, uh, but once it ignites, it's definitely going to add to the injury. Can cotton ignite in a welding environment? Absolutely, uh, cotton can ignite. So uh, by default, I would say that if, if I was a welder, and specifically if I had a loved one who was going into the welding trade, I would make sure that all their garments had flame-resistant properties to wear that task did not cause uh, their garments to ignite. The 
and I think about what you do as a welder. You are myopic. Your single focus is on that bead. Your whole energy, your whole being is making sure that bead is perfect. If you had a big hunk of slag pop off and it falls into a crease in your elbow or if you're kneeling down into the back of your leg, and that garment ignites, it's only a matter of, of seconds before you burn through your nerve endings and you no longer feel it. And then you're on fire. We have we have number of, of uh, examples of welders uh, being hurt very, very seriously or worse yet, being fatalities because their garments caught fire and continued to burn. So even though there's nothing that I can reference you to that's hard and fast and says you have to do it, I would, again, make sure that my uh, garments had flame-resistant properties. All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time. I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions, but all of today's unanswered questions will be forwarded to our speaker. Once again, I hope you take the time to fill out the evaluation survey on your screen to give us your feedback. That ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. I'd like to thank Derek Singh, everyone at Bulwark, and all of our listeners. Have a safe day.